It's our pleasure today to, in, uh, to welcome John Nolan. So he's a professor at the Centillion Institute in San Diego. Uh, his group develops and applies new tools for cells and molecular analysis, including high resolution analysis of EVs. John is also a founder and CEO of Cellarcus Bioscience that offers EV analysis service and tools. Um, he previously received his bachelor degrees in biology and chemistry from the University of Illinois and PhD in biochemistry from Penn State University. Uh, he was previously the director of the National Flow Cytometry Resource at Los Alamos National Laboratory and currently president of the International Society for Advancement of Cytometry, ISAC. John is a fellow of the American Institute of Biological and Medical Engineering, AIMBE. So uh, today he's going to share with us uh, his expertise in uh, single fascicle flow cytometry of EV number, size, and cargo. So please welcome John. Um, so today, yes, I'm gonna tell you about single vesicle flow cytometry and try to convince you that um, it's time for a new gold standard in the field. So first, if I can advance my home, you do my acknowledgements and disclosure. So my uh, academic position is at the Cintillon Institute in uh, San Diego. We mostly are a technology lab. We have our own biological interests, but most of our biology happens through collaboration and uh, we collaborate widely. So uh, we're working with the uh, NIH ERCC uh, group, the Extracellular Communication Consortium. A um, uh, number of collaborators here locally in, uh, in San Diego, um, group of industry um, uh, partners, um, and the uh, Inter-Society EV Flow Cytometry Working Group, which I'll mention uh, a little bit later. And then yes, I've, uh, I'm the, uh, some of the technology I'll talk about today are being commercialized through Solarcus Biosciences, which offers uh, EV uh, analysis services and tools. So trying to advance here, there we go. So here's an overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'm going to first emphasize why it's so important to measure individual EVs um, if we want to understand where they come from, uh, what they carry, and where they're going to go. Um, and sort of I'll give a, my, my assessment, which includes a little opinion about uh, the state of the field in this respect. I'll talk a little bit about why and how people are trying to use flow cytometry to do single vesicle analysis. And then I'll uh, spend the rest of the time talking about our approach to uh, single vesicle flow cytometry um, with a, a, a focus on uh, cargo measurements. Um, so first, why do we want to measure uh, individual EVs? And I'll use this cartoon, which I purloined from a review article of a few years ago, which you know gives a what we know is a simplistic description of the different paths of biogenesis of vesicles. They can come from the surface or they can come from inside the cell. We now appreciate that there's many different pathways, you know, both internal and uh, surface uh, directed for vesicles to be released. Um, and there are many more than just two types of vesicles, but for our purposes, we can consider uh, exosomes and microvesicles, if you wish. Um, those are released into the surface, uh, into, into the extracellular space. Um, carrying cargo from the cell of origin, and they can interact in many ways with the receiving cell to communicate their information. Um, and so, you know, there's a, cu a couple decades now of work on characterizing uh, vesicles, mostly using traditional biochemistry. Um, and it appears that there's pr some pretty interesting stuff in this, uh, these extracellular vesicles. And if we're going to learn something new about intercellular communication, or if we're going to develop some new informative biomarkers, or if we're going to develop some new EV-based therapeutics, it's going to be because of the properties and features of individual vesicles, right? If there's a therapeutic EV carrying some magic cargo, <clears throat> we should be able to measure that EV as an individual. 
And so to elaborate at, on that a little bit more, we know that EVs in uh, extracellular space and certainly in biofluids are uh, complex and heterogeneous. They come from different sources within the cell and from different cells. Um, and so when we apply a conventional biochemical analysis, uh, for example, the classic spin and blot approach uh, depicted here, um, we get a picture of the average vesicle, right? We measure all of the uh, molecular components that are in uh, the sample, the proteins, the nucleic acid, um, and we get the picture of the average vesicle, which is you know, useful to develop a catalog of the components. Um, and we can look in the various online databases, uh, uh, Vesiclepedia and Exo, Arda and others, and, and find these lists of components. Um, but the problem is, is that there is no average vesicle, right? This vesicle here on the right doesn't exist. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a construct uh, combined, you know, that's derived from all these heterogeneous vesicles. What we really want to do is we want to assess uh, EV molecular composition at the single vesicle level. If we can do that, then we can start understanding what are the different subpopulations of vesicles, what are their molecular cargo, and start learning something about way that, where they come from, um, where they might be going in terms of a destination cell, um, and um, thereby improve the value of EVs as either informative biomarkers or potentially as um, therapeutics. And so this is, this is at the heart of the drive for single vesicle analysis. Um, you know, and I'm going to contend here that, you know, no longer should the spin and blot be referred to or considered the gold standard. I think we need a new gold standard that really focuses at the single vesicle measurement, single vesicle level, um, and involves quantitative molecular measurements. Um, so there are some tools for measuring individual vesicles. Um, nanoparticle tracking analysis and resistive pulse spectroscopy are the ones that most people will be familiar with. Um, these have you know, both furthered the field, uh, definitely, but by providing some level of single vesicle analysis. Uh, they're both uh, label-free methods that uh, measure different properties of vesicles and are useful for counting and sizing. Um, there's some cons to both of these. They're relatively nonspecific. That is, they're going to detect any particle, not just a vesicle. Um, they have their own limitations in sensitivity and dynamic range. Um, and, you know, as of yet, no one's really shown a, a robust way to measure cargo uh, using these tools, although I know people are trying. Um, which leads us to flow cytometry, um, which we already know as a very sensitive and quantitative measurement tool for single particles. Um, people use these in cells all the time. They're uh, widely available. Almost everyone uh, is within walking or driving distance of a flow cytometer. There's lots of standards and calibrators to support quantitative analysis. Um, under most cases, you can develop these as homogeneous, no wash assays, and they can be compatible with automation for, uh, for uh, you know, large-scale analysis. Um, but, you know, there are some challenges here. And the biggest challenge, they, they mostly stem from the fact that conventional flow cytometers, those designed to measure cells, really aren't sensitive enough uh, in general to measure vesicles. And so instrument sensitivity um, has definitely been a limitation. This is changing now with the availability of a newer generation of high sensitivity instruments. Um, but the final word on flow cytometers for uh, vesicle analysis probably hasn't been written yet. Um, another big limitation of conventional approaches is that the assays lack specificity. They often use light scatter to detect cells, which makes sense because cells are big and scatter a lot of light. Um, but for vesicles, which are small and hardly scatter any light at all, um, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between vesicles and various other sources of background that are in, uh, are in a sample. 
um, combined with the fact that a lot of the key methodological details uh, aren't, haven't been reported, at least historically, um, has led to reducibility overall. Um, and this is the focus of the, oops, of the EV uh, flow cytometry working group, which is, a, a, I guess, a kind of a formal group now uh, of people who are associated with these different societies and have worked on both vesicle analysis and flow cytometry uh, for some years. And, you know, to address this issue of, of reproducibility and uh, reporting, um, earlier this year, uh, the group published a guidelines manuscript that sort of laid out uh, what you need to report about a flow cytometry measurement. Um, this doesn't necessarily tell you how to do it. Um, there's a manuscript in preparation that might get more towards that. But this is just saying, what do you need to report about your, your measurement? And if you read this paper closely, you'll see that there are aspects of the reporting that are related to the instrument, um, which is important because the instrument is a big part of the measurement. But there's also a big focus on the assay. So the assay is everything else you do to the sample before and after you run it on the instrument. It's how you isolated your sample to begin with, how you stained it and washed it if you did that. Um, all the different positive and negative controls that are necessary to interpret the data. Um, of course, information about the calibration and performance of the instrument is important, but just as important is what you did with that data after you took it, how you dated it, how you analyzed it, and how you finally reported it. Um, and so this is laid out in this manuscript uh, in a very systematic way that can serve as a checklist uh, for you if you are um, either using someone else's uh, vesicle flow cytometry uh, measurement or you have ambitions to develop your own. And so this fits into the rest of the guidelines, uh, sort of documents that support the field, which include those focusing on flow cytometry, um, like my, my flow site, and those focusing on uh, vesicles, like MySev and EVTrack. Um, so I'm not going to say a lot about this uh, today. Um, we've uh, been busy recently. Uh, uh, promoting these guidelines. Um, so I definitely recommend you check out the, the manuscript if you're interested in this. Many of these guidelines apply to other single vesicle measurements as well. So uh, this is, a lot of it's not just specific for flow cytometry. But the flow cytometry working group has uh, a lot of material available for you. There's a, there's a web page. There's a EV flow cytometry Slack workspace um, where discussions uh, occur. Um, there have been a series of live webinars. We've been on uh, hiatus for a couple months this summer, but I expect those will kick up again in the fall. Um, we we're busy, of course, as many of you were, watching the ISEV and ISAC uh, uh, virtual meetings recently, um, and a group of us just did uh, some tutorials for the ISAC CITO meeting uh, that are now online on the YouTube channel, and I mentioned uh, the manuscript and present. Preparation. So there's a whole set of resources that are available to help uh, you do EV flow cytometry. Here's here's the screen. Here's the uh, the web page of the working group and uh, the YouTube uh, uh, channel with the recent tutorials uh, that we just gave last week or the week before. Um, so check those out. I'm I'm not going to cover those in uh, in detail here. Except to point out that, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can use a flow cytometer to measure vesicles. And uh, it's sort of laid out here. Historically, people have used a forward angle light scatter to detect cells, um, but that has def definite disadvantages for uh, EVs, which are much smaller than cells. Um, if one were going to use light scatter to uh, detect an EV, one might choose to use side scatter, which has lower background compared to forward scatter. But even this is, is pretty challenging, uh, using light scatter to detect vesicles. And uh, a number of groups have uh, observed that using fluorescence can provide improved sensitivity and specificity. And in the fluorescence department, we can think about using a fluorescent antibody to detect an EV, uh, which will work. Uh, except that you'll only detect the EVs that 
um, the fluorescent antibody. More general approaches uh, would take a membrane stain or a cytoplasmic stain to stain EVs generally. Um, so one has a, a number of choices to make here. Of course, all of these parameters are interesting as measurements, but when it comes down to uh, choose what am I going to use to actually detect the vesicle, um, one has to make these decisions. And we've tried them all, and the decision we came down to is to use a membrane stain to do the measurement. So we've, uh, this, this is an overview of the vesicle flow cytometry assay. We've uh, you know, reported and talked on this before, so I'll give a quick overview here. It measures EVs directly in uh, a sample, either a diluted biofluid or after you've uh, fractionated or enriched it in some, in some way. Uh, the membrane dye uh, intercalates into the uh, membrane of vesicles uh, in proportion to its surface area. Um, and then often will also stain with fluorescent antibodies, one or more of those. And then we use the fluorescence from the membrane stain, which is red, um, to selectively detect uh, vesicles. Um, and if they're not a membrane particle, they won't stain with the dye and we won't detect them. So we get membrane selectivity here in the staining, uh, which we use to trigger the detection of the instrument. And we measure the membrane fluorescence. And then we measure the fluorescence from any of the uh, fluorescent antibodies that uh, are also staining the vesicle. After we do that measurement of vesicle fluorescence, um, we calibrate the fluorescence. We calibrate the membrane fluorescence in terms of surface area, which is what it's proportional to, and that lets us estimate the diameter of the vesicle population. And we calibrate the uh, antibody fluorescence in units of MESF or molecules of fluorochrome or molecules of antibody. And these are some features of the assay here below. As I mentioned, a few of the newer flow cytometers with high sensitivity detectors um, are better for this than the old uh, lymphocyte analyzers. And on a typical uh, instrument, we estimate uh, right now that our limit of detection for size is between 70 and 80 nanometers, say, and for uh, molecular cargo, we call it 25 molecules, sort of a conservative uh, we're probably doing a bit better than that. So that's an overview of the VFC assay that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And so all the data will have been through this assay. The assay is supported by a number of uh, calibrators and standards, which you know, are a central part, essential part of any uh, robust assay. So we've got some vesicle standards, a synthetic lipid vesicles, uh, the zone that serves as our, our size standard, also serves as a negative control for immunofluorescence. We've got some bead-based uh, intensity and antibody binding standards, which are useful for that fluorescence calibration that I described. And then we've, we developed cell-derived EVs, uh, EVs isolated from specific cell types that bear specific uh, cargo that we're interested in. And these are useful as positive controls for our assays. Um, and so then the way we think about this, we have instruments and you have assays and you know, what Solarcus is looking to provide is the assay kit that will run on these instruments. That is the kit that contains not only the, the reagents, calibrators, the standards, um, but also the protocols for preparing and analyzing the data. And so uh, if, if, if you buy the kit, you you get the protocol, which is all set up for plate-based assays. Um, and then there's also a data analysis uh, template to do the data analysis. And by having well-standardized protocols for both sample preparation and for data analysis, um, we can get you know, good reproducibility both within labs and between labs. Um, the VFC assays include all the essential controls that you know, the working group defined as being important to, uh, to having reproducible uh, reporting, uh, including things like a dilution series, which allows us to test for this coincidence or swarm artifact that's a big issue in the field. Um, it also lets you know what the dynamic range of your assay is, which is, is important. 
in typical use, uh, the VFC assay has a couple logs of dynamic range, so around a hundredfold range of, uh, of uh, vesicle concentration. Um, another important specificity control is to show that your, your, your particles that you're measuring are detergent labile. Uh, we would expect uh, vesicles to dissolve when you add an appropriate amount of detergent to that, and that's a as a controls that are built into these assays as well. Um, so it really has to do with the detection of the vesicles, the measurement of the size, the uh, demonstration of specificity and dynamic range. But really the reason to use single vesicle analysis is to measure the cargo. Um, and there's lots of interesting cargo in vesicles. There's proteins on the surface, there's proteins inside, there's uh, nucleic acids, probably inside, although there's some discussion about how much of those that's on the surface. Um, but anyway, we're going to focus uh, to start with here on surface cargo and we'll, we'll focus on the tetraspanins, which you know, seems to be the first type of protein that most people think about uh, when they think about vesicle associated proteins. And in most uh, papers being published these days, you'll find a Western blot with one uh, of these markers measured. In especially comprehensive measure papers, you might find examples. Oops, excuse me, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen? What's up, man? Uh, stop it, stop it. Uh, we, we lost your screen. Okay, here we got. We got here now. All right. Nope. Yeah, okay. Um, so tetraspanins, um, you know, suggested by MISEV as a, as a marker. Um, we're familiar with the three. Um, there are actually 20 different tetraspanins, uh, at least 20. Um, we've managed to track down antibodies for about seven of those, and we're interested just to learn what's the, what is the expression profiles of tetraspanins on different uh, EV types. And so we're going to use EV immunofluorescence for this. And so I'll just take a couple minutes to uh, remind you or inform you about how we use immunofluorescence to measure EVs uh, in flow cytometry. Um, and the reason I did this is uh, we had Jan Lotvall visit a, you know, a few months ago here, and I took him past one of our posters. And you know, he saw these histograms of, of vesicle size versus fluorescence, and he you know, just held his head and said, oh, these plots. And I could see that he feels, he felt exactly like I feel when I look at Western blots. So you can show me one or two Western blots and I can take it. But if you show me too many Western blots in a row, my eyes start to glaze over. And I understand that can happen to people who are not familiar to looking at flow cytometry data. I just want to take a couple minutes here to, to just walk you through this. And so in, in this central plot here, we have some uh, immunostaining of uh, tetraspanin antibodies on a couple of different EV types. On the y-axis, we have here the size of the vesicles as measured by VFC, and on the, the x-axis, it's the, uh, the immunofluorescence. Uh, the, these parameters have been calibrated, so we can talk about you know, vesicle size, and this is actually, you can think of as number of antibodies found. So in the case of uh, a uniform homogeneous set of uh, EVs, like the EVs you might get some, from some washed platelets, uh, which is what this is, um, you can see that the platelet EVs stain you know, clearly and predominantly for CD9. Is that more than 90% of the vesicles measured here are CD9 positive, and the positives and the negatives are clearly resolved this is almost perfect situation. More often, you'll get a situation where only some of the vesicles are positive. And so here's an example of CD81 expression on a 293T EV. Uh, CD81 is the predominant uh, tetraspanin expressed on 293T cells and their EVs. And you can see that there's clearly two populations. There's a population here that's positive and a population that's negative. 
um, we can set a gate at the edge of the negative population and we can uh, report on the number of EVs that are positive for CD81 above that threshold. Uh, we, can we can measure their brightness. We can express them as a percentage of the total if we know what the total number of EVs are. Um, down below here is just a, a single parameter histogram, which is a, a projection of the fluorescence um, onto, one, onto one parameter. So we've got some positives, we've got some positives and negatives. The third type of pattern one might encounter is where they're all positive, but just a little bit positive. So we can see here that there's just one population of CD9 staining um, on this EV cell type. Uh, and left off the name, I forget what cell type this is, but this is another pattern you will see. And here you can see that one can still draw a gate and call these positive. Um, you can see that would be sort of arbitrary, right? In reality, all of them are sort of positive. They're just not all resolved from the negative population. Um, it's important to have controls, and so we like to use we like these two cell line EVs as controls for uh, CD9 and CD81, uh, respectively. Negative controls are also important, so our liposome uh, size standard doesn't have any antigen, so it's a good negative control. Um, Isotype control is an important negative control to show that your binding isn't due to FC receptors on the EVs. And obviously there's other types of con negative controls one can think of if one had a knockdown or a, a known null EV for a marker that would also be suitable. Um, those of you who have done flow cytometry immunofluorescence before will know that it's important to titrate your reagents. Um, and this is importantly especially important for uh, EV flow cytometry where you typically are not washing uh, the EVs after staining, but just diluting instead. And so it's important to do a antibody titration of all your reagents if you want optimal results. And, uh, you know, positive and negative controls, again, can help you validate an assay. And so here are examples of EVs from red cells and EVs from platelets, um, staining with a canonical red cell marker, CD235 in the case of the red cell, or CD41 in the case of the platelet. Um, uh, working with Alain Brasson, he provided some immunogold staining of each of these, so we have you know, high confidence that the, uh, that the immunofluorescence we're measuring is indeed uh, specific. And you know, with, with a well-tuned uh, immunofluorescence assay, we can now start looking at the tetraspanin expression on different cell types. And so here's a couple cancer cell lines that uh, we've, uh, we've analyzed. Um, you can see uh, the, the unstained vesicles and then the vesicles stained with each of, in this case, five uh, different tetraspanins, each conjugated to PE. PE is probably the brightest widely available uh, fluorescent label for uh, antibodies. So it's the one uh, we start with. The, the calibration is straightforward because there are commercially available PE intensity standard beads. There are, um, in general, the, the number of PEs to antibody is one to one. So it's a, it's a, it's a simple calibration. Um, and you can see the, you know, some of the different patterns we saw uh, earlier. We can see that these Diffie cells are positive for a little bit of CD9 and CD63, but there are clearly some vesicles that don't have either. Uh, the U87 uh, cell line has uh, CD63 um, and also CD82, which is one of the minor tetraspanins that does show up in interesting places for time to time, from time to time. Um, if we expand that, that analysis out, we can, you know, look at EVs from a range of different cell cultures. Um, and if you just look, look, look across the patterns here, you can see all of those 
staining patterns we described before. Some are uh, largely positive, some are you know, weakly positive, some have clearly two populations, some positive and some negative. Um, which is all pretty interesting and you know, certainly provides uh, uh, some food for thought amongst those who you know, will consider tetraspanins as sort of universal uh, EV markers. Um, here I've just sort of digested some of that uh, information into a, a bar graph. Here we're plotting the median fluorescence of the population. So you can think about this as number of molecules of antibody uh, for each of these different uh, tetraspanins on EVs from these different cell lines. And looking at this, you can see that not only does the, you know, proportion or ratio or profile of, of tetraspanins vary from cell type to cell type, so does the absolute amount of tetraspanins. You know, both which tetraspanins are expressed and how much, um, you know, varies in pretty interesting ways. Um, so these were all done with uh, PE conjugates, which, as I mentioned before, is where we start. Um, and now we've, we're starting to put together uh, multicolor panels. Um, in this case, we've got a three-color tetraspanin uh, cocktail, where each of the three tetraspanins bears a different fluorescent label. Um, and this is to allow us to do Look at, look at the tetraspanin uh, profile on a single vesicle level, you know, simultaneously. Um, a, a complication when one starts building out multicolor panels like this is that different fluorophores have different thicknesses, and it's important taking that into account. And so this is where calibrated antibody capture beads come into, into play. So these are calibrated in terms of their antibody binding capacity, so that when we stain them with new fluorescent conjugates, we can get a feel for um, how A, how well the conjugate is labeled and what the resolution we might expect is. Um, but also this allows us to now calibrate in units of antibodies per vesicle. Um, okay, so we know that tetraspanins are on vesicles. I think we knew that already. Um, interestingly, we find that tetraspanin expression varies quite a bit from cell type to cell type, from vesicle type to vesicle type. Um, we know that some EVs don't have any tetraspanins on them, and those are interesting as well. Um, so our next step is to start using uh, surface cargo like tetraspanin with intravesicular cargo. So how do you measure intravesicular cargo? at the single vesicle level? Well, uh, it's hard, uh, harder than measure su measuring surface cargo. And we have not yet figured out how to stain intravesicular antigens with antibodies. We're working on it and we have some ideas, but it's complicated as you might imagine. Uh, but one way to measure intravesicular cargo is to use uh, fluorescent protein. And so here's an example where we've got a neuronal cell type bearing a GFP, or in this case, it's M neon green tag uh, intravesicular cargo. Um, and we're looking at this in a couple of different uh, cell lines. We've got a, a wild type cell line, and we've got a patient derived um, cell line. And this is the cell line without any GFP uh, cargo, and this is the cell line, the two cell lines with GFP cargo. And you can see here, this is this is the the fluorescent protein cargo. There's not very many positive uh, GFP positive vesicles ab above our limit of detection. It's just uh, a couple percent. But if we uh, gate on those uh, positive vesicles and backgate them onto a plot of tetraspanin fluorescence, uh, we can see some interesting things. And so just to describe this a little more carefully, so these vesicles that are over the gate here are higher than the gate. We're going to call those uh, positive for our cargo. And if we highlight those in green here on a, pop on a plot of size versus tetraspanin expression, 
and here we're using a mix of the three tetraspans, we can see that most of the positive vesicles are in a tetraspanin positive population. Um, but in the disease uh, genetic background, uh, we have actually even more fluorescent protein positive vesicles. But if we look at where they appear in terms of tetraspanin expression, we can find that in this case, there's a lot more of the fluorescent protein cargo that's showing up in the uh, tetraspanin negative population. And so this suggests that this genetic lesion is impacting cargo uh, transport such that uh, the, the, the vesicles containing uh, the, the fluorescent cargo um, in, the, in the wild type state are mostly tetraspanin positive, but in the disease state are in uh, to a great degree tetraspanin negative. And so it's an interesting hint as to the intracellular trafficking in biogenesis of disease. I'll give you another example about how we can use cargo to help uh, sort out uh, EVs in complex samples. So we and others you know, would like to measure EVs directly in plasma. Um, but it's hard, as you might imagine, because there's lots of stuff in plasma, not only proteins, but other membrane particles. And in our case, we're measuring uh, membrane particles. So lipoproteins are, of course, uh, of interest. And, Without, with, with only membrane staining, we can't necessarily confidently tell the difference between a vesicle and a lipoprotein. But if we use the multi-parameter capability of flow cytometry, um, we can. So the first thing we notice is when we stain with uh, plasma, and this is just staining diluted plasma uh, directly without any fractionation, um, we, get, we get membrane positive vesicles they have an interesting and complex light scatter pattern. Some of the vesicle, some of the particles scatter quite a bit of light, some hardly scatter any at all, and a number of particles scatter an intermediate amount of light. And so we can sort out what's in these, this population of vesicles by um, using uh, cargo staining. So one cargo we can stain uh, or detect are the esterases present in the cytoplasm. Those will convert uh, non-fluorescent CFDA into a fluorescent product that will be trapped inside the vesicle. And so if we stain uh, uh, plasma with our membrane stain and CFSE, um, we can identify a population of positive vesicles that stain with CFSE. And we can localize these to a particular um, subset of vesicles uh, on a plot of light scatter versus uh, vesicle size. Um, similarly, we can stain that same sample with a mixture of uh, tetraspanins and identify the tetraspanin vesicles and backgate those to uh, a similar uh, light scatter uh, intensity population. And then using, multi, using the multi-parameter measurements of flow cytometry, we can look at the expression of both the CFSE uh, fluorescence, the green fluorescence, and the uh, orange tetraspanin fluorescence, and find that most, but not all, of the vesicles we detect here are tetraspanin positive and CFSE positive. So, you know, measuring cargo helps us reduce complexity in complex samples helps us uh, manage it. Similarly, if we're, work, if we're working in plasma, which we do, we can stain for with some cell-specific markers. And here we're late staining with a red cell marker, a platelet marker, and an XM5, which uh, stains closed phosphatidylserine. And again, we can you know, pick the positive vesicles out of the complex mixture. We can count them, we can size them, and we can look at their co-expression of uh, with these other markers. And so we find, for example, that most of the CD41 platelet-derived vesicles are also positive for an XN5, indicating that they are you know, procoagulant in this case. And so you know, this, this, is, this is why we think it's important and valuable and powerful to measure EV cargo at the single vesicle level. It helps us identify, quantify subsets 
in these complex heterogeneous sets of vesicles. And so what if we want to do something else with the vesicles? Um, what if we want to do mass spec or molecular analysis? Because right now there's really no way to do single vesicle sorting easily. Uh, we can't do single vesicle PCR yet. We can't do that single vesicle mass spec yet. Someday we will, but not today. So what do we do today? Well, we like to use uh, immunocapture, right? So once we know what's on the vesicles, um, then we can design bead-based or surface-based immunocapture assays to pull out specific subsets. And here is just a little illustration with pulling out uh, cell type specific EDs from plasma. This is a plasma sample. We've got some red cell positive vesicles here. We've got some platelet vesicles. Here's a bivariate plot of the red cell marker versus the platelet marker. You can see they're resolved. Um, in this case, we want to recover these platelet EVs out to do something else with them downstream. And so we make a magnetic bead conjugated CD41, and we can incubate that with our plasma. And then after we pull those out, uh, we can show that we depleted those platelet EVs from plasma quantitatively. Um, and then that serves as you know, the QC and the characterization for the downstream analysis of, of, of PCR or what you might wish to do. Um, and that also feeds into other approaches for analysis, which include bead-based assays in general, which don't give the true single vesicle analysis that's important. But once you have the vesicle analysis, uh, can serve as a a useful tool for lots of applications where antibodies immobilized on surfaces can be used for uh, vesicle analysis, in this case using multiplex flow cytometry. Um, and of course people have been using beads and flow cytometry to measure vesicles for some time. And you know, despite the fact that it doesn't uh, measure single vesicles, it's, it still has its uses. So with that, I'll uh, wrap it up and just re-emphasize the fact that, you know, I think we need to think about single vesicle measurements being the gold standard going forward. I think the, uh, the conventional uh, spin and blot bulk analysis method uh, just isn't going to get us very much further down the line. Of course, it's going to have use usefulness, right? If you are interested in an internal cargo and you, you can't detect it directly by, by a single vesicle analysis method, you know, do, doing a Western blot makes sense. But, you know, as a starting point, I think we need to move beyond that. And so I've shown you today how single vesicle flow cytometry can let us do vesicle counting, sizing, and cargo measurements, and that you make some interesting observations, like tetraspanin expressions differ among cell types, and that the cargo associated with tetraspanin positive or negative vesicles can shift. Um, and then if we do the assays and standardize and reproducible, standardize assays with standardized data analysis protocols, we can really get rigorous and reproducible single vesicle measurements. And you know, the assay is really intended to be instrument agnostic. That is, you know, it's, it's in, intended to you know, support the different instruments uh, that are targeting flow site uh, EVs as targets. And so we expect that you know, there's going to be a new generation of flow cytometry instruments that are actually really designed to measure single vesicles. And that should make our assay even more powerful. And I anticipate that within the next five years, we will be doing single molecule, uh, single vesicle measurements. So with that, I'll stop. I went a little bit longer than I want to, but hopefully there's still time for questions. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation. It's very important to have this kind of presentations where we have guidelines for such an important method to study EVs. Um, so thank you so much for clarifying a lot of points. We have several questions. Um, maybe we can start with Phil, who has a couple of questions, and then we will move to Tatiana Wagner and then Alisa. So. And then I'll look at the, if there is anybody else, okay?
Yes. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, we've made the observation with of immunoglobulin light chains on the surface of exosomes and wondered if you had a chance to look. That is, you need to have a, a definitive antibody that stains light chains and not heavy chains and not whole immunoglobulin. And the second question was that it is said that maybe no, there are no two vesicles that are alike. Um, and you haven't looked at a lot of parameters yet, but where do you think that question might end up? So in the first question, immunoglobulin light chains, I know that there are good antibodies for kappa and lambda light chains uh, from reputable antibody vendors. So I would imagine that one could measure that uh, in a fairly straightforward way. We, ha we have not tried to do that yet. I wish you would. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put it on my list. I'll put it on the list. In immunological, you know, with, with immune population, vesicles from immune populations have them. Yep. Not from normal population, but normal do too, at a low level. Yeah. So, so, so the second question is, uh, are there any two EVs alike? Well, so take the case of our platelet EVs. So we get platelets, we wash them really well, and then we induce them to release vesicles and we collect the vesicles. Those appear to be pretty uniform. Uniform. They have, of course, a distribution and how many copies of the different surface markers they have. Um, but they appear to be pretty uniform. They all stain with CFSE, uh, et cetera. Um, if you look at even a simple cell culture, uh, you can see lots of heterogeneity, though. Um, and certainly, if you're moving into uh, complex biofluids, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity. Um, so it's you know, going to be important to start tracking this, um, not only to look at the different types of vesicles that come out from a single cell type, for instance, but also looking at how cell culture conditions affect those uh, EVs, especially in the context of like MSC EVs as therapeutics, right? Right now, people are just treating these as a monolithic population of vesicles where uh, we know that there's actually heterogeneity in there, and that heterogeneity varies with the culture conditions of the cells. And so as we move into the brave new world of EV therapeutics, I think people are going to have to think about that. Well, that would be very good. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Tatiana Wagner. Uh, can you take it? Hi, John. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, well, my question, you actually answered it. So when you mentioned the membrane dye and you said that you ensure this, so it's specific for membrane, my question was how you can make sure that you're analyzing EVs and biofluids, but um, so in your following slides, you show that you use SFSE. So then I guess I can rephrase my question. Have you looked at the, because this dye would require that vesicles actually carry the enzyme. So in your in vitro systems, have you looked like what percentage of vesicles actually carry the enzyme? We have. Thank you. And it, like many things about vesicles are interesting. So I mentioned the platelets. They, as, as prepared, stain very uniformly with CFSE, um, homogeneously. Interesting, red cell vesicles stain a little bit, but not nearly as much. And, you know, as we've had the opportunity to survey vesicles from different cell lines, uh, it varies. Um, mm -hmm. So CFSE isn't, in our view, a very good candidate as a universal marker, but it could be a very useful discriminator of different vesicle types, depending on, you know, based on uh, esterase enzymes, for instance. And one can think about generalizing this to other enzyme activities in vesicles using other fluorogenic substrates and we're, in we're interested to do that. Um, so it's interesting. Um, so for example then if you are looking at cancer derived EVs in undiluted plasma does it mean that you will have to somehow get rid of uh, platelet derived EVs in the first place because they will create like a they will make up the most of the vesicles in the sample? So that's definitely an issue. So there's a lot of parallels to the uh, challenges of circulating tumor cell measurement by 
uh, flow cytometry. It's a rare event uh, challenge. And so by using the multicolor capabilities of flow cytometry, you could, for instance, label the platelet EVs so as to exclude them from the analysis. So essentially making a dump channel to get rid of the stuff you're not interested in. So you can more directly focusing on the ones that have, for instance, a tumor marker that you're interested in. But even then, you know, you're going to have an issue of how rare are these vesicles. Right? And if your tumor vesicles are only there at one in a million, uh, you're going to be waiting a long time for that tumor vesicle to come through. So there, there some enrichment or fractionation approach up front is probably going to be part of most workflows. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Before getting to Alisa's question, we have one from uh, Eriomina Sh. And then there is another one also. Hello, Eddie Minasha. Hi. Um, Hi. I, have, um, I have a question, a technical question about um, Gallius is a flow cytometer. I don't know if you have um, heard about it, culture, Beckman culture. And we have this in our lab, and I was wondering if I can use it uh, for direct flow cytometer on AVs. Um, in principle, um, it's going to depend on your particular instrument. Um, so you'll want to uh, calibrate it, see what its resolution is and limit of detection. And that can be done by using the appropriate calibration standards and protocols. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, I would check in with the EV flow cytometry group who you know, deals with these things all the time. They could give you some uh, pointers and tips. Contact me offline and I'll, I'll tell you what I think too. Um, so in principle, you can. The, the trick is to calibrate your instrument and characterize it and you know, establish that it's, it's, it's suitable. Okay. Um, I, I had another one uh, uh, about the antibodies that bind the, the AVs. Does uh, do these antibodies um, increase the size of the AVs or they are too small? So the, you know, an antibody is, I don't know, about 10 nanometers in size. If you, got, if you have it labeled with phycoerythrin, which is a large fluorophore, maybe another 10 nanometers in size. So you might have 10 or 15 extra nanometers. And if, you, if it's coating the vesicle, you, you may have added 30 nanometers of dimension to something that was already 100 or 120, something like that. So it makes a bigger particle. It doesn't appear bigger in size to us because we're measuring the membrane, not the hydrodynamic radius. Um, we have noticed, however, that ch adding antibodies to the vesicles can actually change their light scatter. Um, so there, there are ways to sense the antibodies on the, on the surface. Whether that's, whether that's a useful or annoying, we haven't decided yet, but the light scatter of vesicles does change when we label them with antibodies. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is from uh, Sheila Abraham. Hi, John. Um, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, what I'd like to ask you is, um, have you, what's the maximum number of antibodies that you've added um, to stain your EVs? Like, is there a, a sort of limit in terms of steric hindrance? Um, and uh, ample, like optimal number of um, different tetraspanins or whatever you're staining for. Yep, so there's a couple parts to that question. The first is sort of how many antibodies can you fit on a vesicle? Um, if you consider a 120 nanometer vesicle and imagine that the antibodies were just right next to each other coating the vesicle, which is never going to happen, but um, we calculate like six or 700 maximum per vesicle. But of course, as the vesicles get larger or smaller, the surface area changes as the square of the radius. So for bigger vesicles, you might get more, for smaller vesicles, you might get less. Um, so it's potentially an issue. But the, you know, the other question is, how do you use different antibodies in a measurement? Often you're not looking to stain the same vesicle with all those six or seven antibodies. Typically, you're trying to use those antibodies to identify different vesicles. So any single subset of vesicle may be only positive for one or two antibodies. So in reality, the, you know, 
it depends on your system. In our case, you know, we've gone up to six or seven color assays, but in no case are we trying to fit all six or seven of those antibodies on a single subpopulation of EVs. We're looking to use those six or seven colors to stain different types of EVs so we can assess the different populations. Uh, but it's, it's a question that has to be considered. So with the six or seven antibodies that you um, use, uh, can you uh, identify like the maximum number that you've seen that are co-stained? Like what, what was the maximum number that you identified as a, as a population that co-stains? In terms of number of antibodies per vesicle? Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll start from that, you know, few hundred number. So if we, if we stain uh, vesicles with three different uh, tetrastanin antibodies, for example, and we measure the amount of each of CD9, CD63, and CD81, and then we come back with a cocktail of all three of those in one mix, we rarely recover the full number that we would have expected just from adding up the three individual measurements. And so that suggests that there is some steric hindrance that happens at some level. And if, if knowing the number was important to you, um, then you would need to consider that somehow. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the, um, I just have another small question. When you use a flow cytometer, do you have it um, dedicated for EV work or do you use um, a flow cytometer that is used for cell and EV work? Um, so our, our instruments are multi-purpose. So they're used for both cells and EVs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are different ways you can use a flow cytometer to measure EVs. Uh, the traditional way, the way most people do it, even today, is they use light scatter to detect. And it's really important to have a super clean system when you're trying to use light scatter. And I think a lot of people dedicate instruments that include sensitive cleaning protocols, et cetera. When you move over into fluorescent staining, in a way it's a lot more forgiving because your backgrounds are much lower in fluorescence generally. And if your staining is specific and you can show that through the appropriate controls, um, it becomes much easier to run these assays in a mixed environment like this. And so we typically don't we clean our machine, of course. We don't want a dirty machine, but we just use regular milliq water as sheath fluid, um, and we'll run EVs in between two people who are running cells. It's, it's not really an issue. Okay, so, so next, next question is from Alisa. So we can move to the some plasma discussion. I also have some questions, and there are some more questions on that. Let's try to finish in five minutes or so. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Hi, John. So I've probably asked you this before at meetings, but um, I know, I guess what I'm interested in is the CFSE staining and whether it's better than the lipid dye for plasma staining of EVs or whether you use both or um, what's your, you know, maybe you could give some sense of that. Yep. So we use both. Um, we don't think it's better just because it's really measuring esterase activity, right? And EVs from different sources clearly have different amounts of esterase activities and they stain differently with CFSE. And you can see this when you do it on culture derived EVs. Um, whereas the, you know, the lipid stain appears, you know, more generic, in a way a little bit too generic because we'll also pick up the larger lipoproteins. But as I mentioned, you can use light scatter to help differentiate lipoproteins from uh, vesicles as uh, Edwin Vanderpoel has shown. Um, or you can use a counter stain like CFSE or a tetraspanin mix or you know, these different colors. And so we can define a set of vesicles that are lipid positive, CFSE positive, and tetraspanin positive. But if we look carefully, we can also find ones that are tetraspanin positive but CFSE negative and CFSE positive and tetraspanin negative. Sure, so yeah. Challenges our definition of what's an EV, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. And then in terms of the antibody staining, um, I know for the purified EVs, you've often washed them out. Um, for plasma, what do you do? Do you use size exclusion or washing or, 
or do you just dilute the antibodies out? Yeah, so, so we don't do any washing and, and for the reasons that it's just really hard and you, you change the sample when you do that. Um, size exclusion, other people have done that. Um, what we do is we do a good job of titrating our antibodies so we know we're using just enough to saturate binding but don't have so much extra that it's gonna cause a high net bound. And we've worked out that dilution step, that post-stain dilution step to get free antibody down low enough. Um, so no, it's just uh, it's just a dilution step post wash. Okay. Um, you know, SEC wouldn't SEC will you know help, but it dilutes the sample and you worry about loss and it's one more step and it's it's not necessary in our experience. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um. I, so, so I also have a quick question. You've shown very nicely that if you um, if you stain with CD forty one plasma vesicles um, and you you subtract that positivity, you have much fewer vesicles in the plasma. That would be my conclusion. Have you tried to immune capture with CD forty one and then look at the tetraspanning patterns and see if that changes? Yeah, we have. So we can, uh, so we do those bead-based assays I talked about. So we can capture the vesicles by CD41 and then counter stain them with other molecules. And CD41 positive uh, platelet-derived vesicles, the predominant tetraspan in there is CD9, for example, and not a little bit of CD63 and no detectable CD81 that we can both see. So yeah, I mean, those, those, those fit together, right? So once you know what the surface expression is, that identifies your subset of vesicles. And yeah, you can come in with a, a, a bead capture approach and either pull those out and deplete them because you don't want them anymore, or you can pull them out and capture them so that you can do something else uh, interesting. And, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of people would like to sort vesicles, but you know, aren't, aren't really, it's hard to do. So immunomagnetic capture beads is a, is a practical way to pull out. Vesicles. Do you think the sorting will ever be possible, at least for large vesicles? Um, yes, you can sort. People, people, you know, have sorted. Um, there will be new instruments that come out that will be more sensitive and may be more practical to sort. But it depends on what you want to do with the sorted vesicles. Vesicles are a million times smaller than a cell. So if you want to do mass spec or RNA, that's going to be a long sort to get enough material to do anything. Um, but, you know, that's a challenge to the molecular people to come up with uh, more sensitive PCR and mass spec methods, and then maybe we can, uh, we can do something. So, okay. lot, lots to be done. Lots to be done. They, they are making a lot of strides in those areas, so <laughs> hopefully. So, there is another question from uh, Lucia Languino, and then one from Dan, and, and then I think we should close it. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Dolores. Oh, hi, John. A wonderful talk. <clears throat> John, given the uh, you know, focus of your research on identifying single EV measurements, uh, is it, do you see possible and easy to do an RNA uh, quantification in the single vesicle using fluorophore containing probes? I know there is a paper in uh, Science or Science Signaling on uh, delivery or well, detection of RNA in uh, single EVs. They just came out. Have you tried? We've we've tried. We've tried hard, um, and have not succeeded. Oh, um, it's, uh, it's it's a great challenge. Um, you look at the numbers of people trying to figure out how many micro RNAs there are per vesicle, and the number comes out like one per thousand vesicles or something like that. So there's not a lot of RNA in vesicles, um, and these intercalating dyes that you know, we've been trying to use, they'll intercalate at about one fluorophore per five base pairs or so. So you, if you've got a 25 base mirror, um, you're only gonna get five fluorochrones in there and that's, that's not gonna make for a bright, uh, a bright vesicle. I think okay. we'll probably have better luck starting on the large end of the vesicle range. So maybe out in the large oncosome region where things are maybe a half a micron or a micron there might actually be enough nucleic acid in there to, to detect and we're, we're, we're poking at that now. So it's not easy. It's not Thank easy. you, John. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Actually, I, 
I needed to, so I don't start a new line of research on that. Thank you. Um, so now there is a question. There are actually a few more questions. Uh, one from Yanel Bernardi, which is along the same lines. Can we do this quickly? Yeah, Hi, I'm Sean. Uh, yeah. Nice talk. Um, my question is uh, similar to uh, Lucia's question. Uh, how you detect uh, microRNAs in in the even uh, flow citrometry? We have not. We've tried um, and have been unsuccessful that I've been able to convince myself. Um, so I just think that there's not enough not enough stuff in there to detect using current technology. So there's still still an opportunity for someone to to make a break. Okay. Ben, thank you. Next. Hi, John. Uh, thanks. That was a great talk. And it's also comforting to see all the struggles that you go through with this uh, makes us feel a lot better. So I was wondering if you could recommend um, any antibodies for CD9, 63, or 81 um, for mouse uh, studies. I saw that a lot of the stuff that you're doing is human. Um, are there conjugated antibodies that you would recommend or maybe conjugating those in-house? Um, so you, you can contact me offline. Um, we've, we've worked out the humans, uh, quite well and have started on the mouse. And so we, we think we have the, the three main tetraspanins, uh, figured out for the mouse and, you know, are expanding from there. So yeah, in principle, I mean, it's basically just trial and error, you know, buying antibodies from different, uh, companies, trying different clones. You know, not antibodies have to be pretty clean for EV flow. So some manufacturers provide a higher quality, cleaner product than others. And so there's a little, there's a little shopping that is involved there too. And then at the end of the day, if, if commercial products aren't good enough, uh, you end up having to make them yourself. So feel free to shoot me an email. All right, thank you. Okay. And then there is another, the last question from Patricia Ozawa. Yes. Hi. No. Okay. Yes, I am. <laughs> I was just wondering if you do a manual gating for every experiment or if you have an ultimate way to analyze your data. Because I noticed from some graphs that they look different. So I was just wondering. Um, so in general, we are using uh, manual setting of gate uh, by an expert human, you know, who looks at the negative control and sets a threshold and uh, reports the data. And so once we set up our gates based on our positive and negative controls, then we just run the analysis as a batch. Um, the use of automated and AI assisted computational tools to analyze this type of data, I think, you know, is interesting and has some potential. Um, but, you know, our data is, you know, basically is the, is the human there who knows what sample they're running and adjusts the gates based on their um, experience and instructions of the protocol. Thank you so much again, uh, John. I'll pass it to Carolina uh, for closing the meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much, John. This is very uh, full of information and also tips and tricks to how to analyze uh, either cell culture or uh, biofluids, and in this case, uh, plasma-derived vesicles uh, using flow cytometry. So uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, also thanks, Dolores, for leading the question and answer. Uh, been wonderful discussions.